Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, which is all about video marketing. Uh, my name is Danny, and I'm thrilled to be hosting today's event with you all. I'm going to introduce our three magnificent speakers in just a moment. But before I do, just a few quick notes for those of you who've not attended any of our webinars before. So on the right hand side, you can see a few different things. Firstly, there's a chat function to say hello and to let us know where it is you're tuning in from. You can chat amongst yourselves. And also our head of marketing, Frankie, is in there too. So do say hello to him uh, in there. The Q&A tab, which is next to the chat function, is to ask any questions you have for today's speakers. So you can ask questions at any point throughout the webinar. Just throw them in the Q&A tab for us there. We are recording today's event, and we'll share this recording with you early next week. Uh, I'd ask a small favor. If you, if you do enjoy today's content, and you think others in your company or other people in your network would benefit from seeing it, please uh, do think about doing a share on social media or within your organization's Teams chats or, uh, or other channels. Finally, we have polls and an end of webinar survey. So kindly share your thoughts by answering uh, those when they come up. And I'm going to throw a poll in straight away to see how many people I've sent to sleep already. And the first poll is about editing software. So you can see it on your screen now. What video editing software do you currently use? Click all and any that apply. And I'll get on to introducing today's speakers whilst you're doing that. So we've got Chris, Sarah, and Will uh, as our guest panel today. The, the three of them have extensive video expertise and have worked on a variety of client video projects in the past. Their specialist skill sets include video editing, audio, social media creation, and much, much more. So if you're sat in the audience and you're a bit like myself, a marketer who's uh, dabbled in video creation before but lack the overall expertise to take your video creation to the next level, then you're sure to learn something today. And of course, that is our aim over the next 45 to 50 minutes or so. We want you to leave this webinar thinking about at least one area of your video marketing, and that's what we're going to aim to do. We are going to cover or going to try and cover these four areas. So tools and techniques for video creation, 2D animation, a couple of stories from the road where Chris and Will are going to talk to you about a couple of case studies, and then some ideas for how to effectively distribute video content. But before we get started with that, we're going to share a little video that we've created earlier. And this is touching on the importance of storytelling and will hopefully set the scene for what we're going to be talking about today. From cave paintings to TikTok, for thousands of years, humans have found ways to communicate through storytelling. Over time, the media may have evolved, but the art of creating a story that resonates with its audience has stayed the same. Today, scientific marketers face the challenge of communicating complicated stories to their audience. But no matter how complex the product is, the general structure remains the same. You have a beginning, a middle, and an end. The beginning sets the scene of your plot and introduces the character or characters of your story. In the middle, we introduce a conflict, and at the end, a resolution is revealed. In today's market, video is one of the most effective ways of communicating your stories to your target audience. A powerful story focuses on what you help others to do, rather than what your product itself does. Storytelling is effective because it drives an emotional response. Storytelling evokes emotion, and emotion evokes action. Thank you, Sarah, for creating that. Um, that's the last time I do any sorts of videos for you. Um, just before we get started, great that we've got people joining us from all over. So Switzerland, the UK, Netherlands, uh, Cheshire, Whitby, Wrexham, Cambridge, Austria, Surrey, Germany, lots of people in the States as well. So happy Thanksgiving to you guys for tomorrow. Uh, people from all over. So great to have you all with us today. and hope we can provide you with some value over the next 45 minutes. Chris, I'm going to come to you for the first question. We're going to talk about tools and techniques for video creation. Uh, I wonder if you could share a couple of challenges of telling stories in scientific industries. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think the the big thing is, is product videos always seem to be, be an interesting one. And you always find internal challenges, internal battles that everyone must face, especially within 
within the marketing departments and product managers and, and experts and everything like that. Um, and it's, it's being able to know what type of product video you, you, you want, you know, who, who is that audience going to be? You know, is it going to be a demo video, um, you know, which is going to tell you how something works from start to finish, or is it going to be promotional? Um, so sometimes if it's going to be just a promotional video, that might be 30 seconds to a minute long. And uh, yeah, you want to put it on trade shows, you want to put it on, on the web and, and, and all other types of promotional materials. Um, but then you get that product manager who, who wants to make sure that you, it, you know, it has three USB-C slots. Make sure you mention that in the video, but it's a, it's a promotional video. Um, and it's about understanding who that audience is. If it is for distributors, is it, if it is for existing customers and they need an ease of use video, then yeah, then let's talk about those three USB-Cs at the back of the instrument. Um, otherwise, if it's promotional, it just needs to be all singing and all dancing. This is what it does. This is the unique selling point um, and, and lots of nice calls to action. Awesome. So what about the different types of videos, Sara, when you're trying to get, or well, depending on what it is you're trying to achieve, what are the different types of videos and how can we use them? Um, this, there are as many as you can think of. You might use a video interview or a webinar snippet for social media or to the animation to tell complex stories, testimonial videos, interview style videos, documentary style videos, promotional product, company training. There are, there are so many types, but they all help companies to tell their stories and share the messaging. Yeah. So. When we're when we're looking to tell stories, Chris, I'm coming back to you on this, and we want to start storyboarding things. How, with the t depending on the type of video you're doing, and I know Sarah's going to talk a bit more about 2D animation later. But say we're doing a product video or a promo video, how do you go about storyboarding that from the start to tell a really good story? Absolutely. Well, I mean, everything's always got a beginning, middle, and end. I know you said that in your in your video before, and it's 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 true there in a way. And we like to storyboard in sections. Um, and those sections can be can be moved around wherever needed. It's it's always good to. What I would say, if you're going to do a product video and you're going to organise a product video shoot, I would actually plan to do everything, every type, every different type of video for your product. So um, think about throwing in the kitchen sink straight away. So um, have that demo video, um, and then within your storyboard, you can then shorten that. You can take a few sections out, and then that can become your promo video. Shorten it a few. Uh, a bit more and then it can actually become a social media snippet then so in one shoot you could probably get about three or four different types of video for the same products but for all all four different audiences yeah and that's that's isn't it? it's about being efficient with your marketing budget your marketing time and your resources will what about when you go into a shoot what sort of hardware do you do you have in the bag to to get get all these sort of videos put together yeah well uh, with the kind of videos we tend to shoot, uh, often the kind of locations that we're working with are uh, demo labs or you know, academic labs. Uh, it, the instrument rooms tend to not be very spacious, not have a ton of natural light. So um, we and also, you know, we uh, certainly pre-COVID, we used to travel all over the world uh, to do these things. So being able to uh, pack everything into a bag that we can carry on to a plane was very important. Uh, that's beginning to pick up again now. We're doing a lot less remote stuff and trying to you know, push back into uh, traveling around the world some more. Um, but yeah, so we've always put an emphasis on portability and compact. Like, how can we get a nice, polished, professional product without needing to haul an entire sort of Hollywood style film or TV set into someone's lab and take it over for like an entire day? So um, yeah, we use a lot of DSLR cameras or small format uh, video cameras. Mm -hmm. Uh, we like using uh, sort of little LED light panels that are really affordable these days. Those are great because you can pack a whole bunch of them in a bag and you can, particularly in a small room, uh, they do, you know, plenty of, uh, they give you plenty of lighting to work with. And then where we like to focus on, uh, where we, the one area we don't compromise is on the audio. Because if you have nice clear audio, uh, particularly when you're recording interviews, stuff like that, where the, the, the message is coming across uh, from a speaker that's on camera. If the audio is really clear, you can get away with a lot more sort of economizing and, and sort of lightweight gear uh, in all other areas. So we use really high quality lav mics sort of broadcast quality stuff that like, you know, is basically the best you can get to make sure that that's top notch. Yeah. So you turn up at a shoot, Chris, and you've organized this, or this has been organized between our team and their marketing departments. And then all of a sudden, 
yourself and Will turn up with all, all your stuff and the scientists are a bit taken aback. Is that the general reaction? Or are they expecting you to be there with your sort of Hollywood style setup or are they do they become more comfortable very quickly? Yeah, the uh, it's very it, it's very different. It's certainly case by case when it comes to when it comes to scientists. Usually, you get people that would uh, will will go on for hours and hours and hours. Otherwise, you get people that will give you the uh, one word answers and and, uh, and and need warming up. But usually, um, they're, they're they're a little relieved when we turn up because we're a lot more portable, um, you know. And they, they're thinking that an entire crew is going to turn up when you know we just show up and we have our we have our equipment and we don't. You know, we don't shut down the lab or anything like that, so people can continue with the work as, as normal. Um, and generally, what we try and do is have a conversation. You know, we uh, we we talk to them about something that they're going to be most passionate about, which is usually going to be the research or product or something like that. And then all of a sudden, you get you get you get perfect content. Then they they, they you know they're more engaged and they're happy to talk about it. And usually, then they they're very much happy to to talk about to talk about your product instrument. Yeah. And like you said, during the course of that conversation, you'll probably get good stuff for the promo video, but then there'll be other stuff you can repurpose that, that content for. And yeah. um, we'll go back to the poll. So um, about almost half the people are using Adobe Suite. I know mm -hmm. we're using that a lot in-house. The second most YouTube studio editor and um, iMovie's up there as well. And quite a lot of people are using a different one. I'm sorry if I haven't listed yours. I just went for everyone I could remember when I put this poll together. Sorry, I know you're using Adobe a lot. Um, is that the best you find? Is it has it got all the function functionality you need? For me, yes, because I have this background and I've taken the time to learn it in uni. It can be quite a bit not very user friendly, so you have to have very in depth knowledge to do. the The advantage there is that you can do pretty much whatever you can think of. But there's I've also used uh, Canva. I also used Vimeo. I've, I haven't used YouTube Studio, but that's that's interesting, especially knowing that so many many people uses it. But yeah, there's there's always something that you can use, even if you don't have the most extensive knowledge. Yeah. What about you, Chris? Mainly Adobe, right? Yeah, uh, yeah definitely. Um, years ago, I used to be uh, a, re a real fan of Final Cut Pro, and then they they turned it. <laughs> they, they, yeah, I don't know what they turned it into. But um, but yeah, we use Adobe Creative Suite, and it's great because all the different programs talk to each other. So After Effects talks to Premiere. Um, you know. Photoshop talks to Premiere as well. So you can do a, lo a host of all different things. Um, and what's good about it is, you know, um, it's simple enough, you know, if, you, if you've not got that much knowledge of, of video editing, it's simple enough to use. Um, but also if you if, if you like the, the more technical stuff, it's, it's got that capability as well. Awesome. Well, the same for you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we live in Adobe. And yeah, I agree with Chris that like if if you're looking to do any sort of uh, sort of video production at volume or it's something you really want to get into and do a lot of, it's definitely worth putting in the time to learn Adobe. Like it's not that difficult to pick up the basics and it does, you know, once you're comfortable with it, it does then allow you to do literally anything. Um, but yeah, as Sarah said, like there are other tools if it's literally a, a quick, you know, couple of snippets that you want to put together for LinkedIn or whatever, uh, then yeah, using a tool like Canva or Vimeo Create uh, can help you get started really quickly. It's all sort of drag and drop interfaces that's really easy to use. And yeah, YouTube Studio as well. Again, if it's if it is just sort of snipping up a video into shorter clips and putting a start and end card on it, something like that, that gives you those basic tools that basically anyone can pick up and just and just use straight out of the box. Yeah. It'd be interesting the people who selected YouTube Studio Editor, if, if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat how you find it, what sort of functions you're using it for. It'd be interesting to to learn a little bit more about that. Yeah. And um, we're going to throw a second poll out to the audience, and this is all about drone footage. So Chris's favorite topic. So we want to know if you guys are using any drone footage in your videos uh, at the moment. Uh, and Chris, I'll come back to you. What about drones? What do you, are people using them? How are they using them? What do you think? It's uh, it's really funny. Um, drones just seem to now um, be, be one of the main questions I seem to be answering um, a lot of the time now. And um, they're a lot more popular now. A lot more people can access them and they're a lot more, you know, cost effective and whatnot. And there's a lot more hobbyists out there too. Um, you've even seen things like weddings now. Weddings have got, um, I've got drone operators to capture them the magical day. Um, it's, it's, it's really interesting um, because uh, it depends on how you want to use a drone. You know, um, we can actually capture drone footage uh, using stock footage um, and we can add that in and that can, that can really, you know, show a certain location or area or application uh, or anything like that. Um, 
So it's good for that. Uh, if you want to get drone footage of your facility or anything like that, that's a that's a little bit different. Um, first and foremost, there are there are a lot of rules. You almost have to get a pilot's license or a form of a pilot's license, and that varies by region um, uh, and also by state. If it's in the United States, um, they all have different laws. Um, so, for example, in the UK, uh, you can get a basic you can get basic qualifications where you can you know basically fly a drone with people around in the area, and then that they, they have different tiers. Then, so you can then get a drone operator that can um, operate indoors. That costs a lot more money. <laughs> there's a lot. There's a the risk assessment's pretty big, um, and the drones are a lot bigger, and uh, and there's a there's a there's a lot more that's that's needed for that. So if you're ever thinking I'd like some indoor drone footage, I'd always think you know kind of steady cam, um, kind of steady cam do a good job because it probably can. Um, but if you have a big budget, then why not go for it? it? It can look really good. But yeah, we're um, we're seeing a lot more requests for for exterior drone footage, which is uh, which is really nice. And will is drone footage all shot in four K? Is is that what the what the end product is once you've once you filmed that? With most of like the 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 prosumer drones that you can get now that yeah give you the sort of video quality you want yeah the I think the majority of them shoot in four K and really that's what you'd be looking for I think because um, it can be a little difficult to uh, guess what, you know. The, the, one of the hardest things about sort of getting drone footage is someone has to essentially pilot it and operate the camera at the same time. So with 4K, it gives you the flexibility where you can shoot a little wider than you think you're going to need. And if you actually end up wanting to reframe it slightly, you've got enough resolution to push in um, and sort of crop it to what you actually want or to stabilize it if the motion's a bit jerky, if there was a gust of wind or something. Mm. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I think for that reason, like yeah, 4K is definitely something to look for. Awesome. Um, I hope everyone's found that section useful. We're going to move on to the second part now, which I'm going to hand over the slides to Sarah, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about 2D animation. So, Sarah, you have control. Over to you. Thank you, Danny. So, hello, everyone. I'm Sarah. I have over seven years of experience with illustration and three of them with animation as well. So, I started with Premiere Pro, which is for simple video editing, but I ended up falling in love with After Effects which lets you create videos and animated designs without any limits. Anything you can think of, as I said, you can probably do in After Effects. And over the last couple of years, I've noticed that there's been an incredible surge in demand for 2D animation as a marketing tool, with so many people stuck in lockdown and still tra having trouble filming live videos to this day. 2D animation has become a great alternative to display products and services. And I feel that especially the science and technology industries have realized the potential of animation. So why and when would you use 2D animation? Well, first, to explain complex topics with illustrations and visuals, which really helps to display the benefits of your product and effectively. I did this for a recent release of ASO Intel 4.0, which is a marketing analysis tool. And I created a video animating the platform and explaining the features. So, Danny, can we play a little bit of that, please? Of course. Connect your website's Google Analytics to your Azo Intel account and get real-time business intelligence from your website. View all your website's top-level data with one simple login. See which sources and pages are generating the most traffic at a glance. Set your own personal website goals and measure the value of your website's actions. So my face in there again, sir. <laughs> right, so this, this kind of video not only helps our sales teams explain the product, but it also especially helps the client as well, because they can understand what ASO Intel does in less than a couple of minutes. And one of my favorite uses of 2D animation is to present data. So as I said, I come from a graphic design background, so I really believe in the power of an engaging and visual presentation. It can turn a boring report into a full marketing piece. And an example of this is our audience displays. So we have newsletters for numerous topics and industries. And I created a video to display data on one of these industries, sensors. So Danny, let's, let's play a little bit of that one.
I love this kind of videos because it can turn a couple of numbers on a PDF into a whole engaging piece. And they are especially useful for companies that work with big data or analytics reports, etc. But potentially any content can turn into animation. And with so many people now engaging with this type of content, the best reason you can find to start creating it is just to simply engage more people with your content and with your brand. And let's not forget that once the animation is made, you can then repurpose it for social, embed it on your website, create a written piece to complement it. There's many possibilities. So if you are interested in creating animating content, but don't have the time to sit down and learn and hold you up, or like After Effects, or don't have the budget to invest in the software, here are a couple of my favorite apps to start with animation. First one is Canva. And I know if you're a graphic designer, you either love or hate Canva. But objectively, it is a decent platform for the BC marketer. It has two different options for animations. So you have animated <coughs> stickers, which are little animated pictures in a loop, effectively a GIF. Or you can also animate each element separately with some pre-made options and templates. And it does help when you want to turn a social image or a presentation into something a little bit more engaging. And the next one is Vimeo, which is a similar platform to YouTube, where you can upload your videos and embed them everywhere. But it also has a creation mode where you can upload your footage with lots of stock footage and animations as well. You can add text, lots of different transitions and effects and audio tracks, which makes it a great option to create quick and really good quality videos about your products and announcements, etc. And what is the process like creating animations? Well, this is the way that we work with clients. So first, you send us your brief with your ideas and anything that you want to include. From there, we sketch a storyboard and show you for your approval so you can get a feel for the visual style. And we make sure it's exactly what you're looking for. Once that's approved, we then send you the animation still. So like an example, you can see exactly what's going to look like with a brief description of the animation on each scene. And if you're happy with it, we then create and share the animation with you and make any edits if needed. So what my colleague Danny is going to play an example of an animation we did for Hyden Analytical. Danny, let's play a, a little bit of that. Gas analysis by mass spectrometry. Fast, sensitive and quantitative. Sample is automatically pumped into the mass spectrometer with a sampling inlet. A representative sample in viscous flow is continually sampled through the capillary to provide real-time measurements. Haydn's gas analysis systems are versatile instruments with a range of interchangeable sampling inlets. So this process ensures both parts are on the same page and neither wastes any time. And it's something you should be looking for if you're thinking about outsourcing your animation projects. And with this, I pass the mic back to back to you, Danny. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. There's just a before we move on, Will Chris, just a few questions that I'd like to get answered before. Um, so if you have got questions, please do send them in at any any time throughout today's uh, webinar. We'll do our best to answer as many as we can. The the first one, Will, I'll come to you with is about. Um, so they're asking what frame rate would you recommend some cameras are set to. 50 frames per second, is this too much? Uh, so for interview footage, if you've got a talking head, uh, 24 <laughs> or 25 frames per second is is plenty uh, faster than that. Uh, I find looks a little weird. Some people like the higher frame rate, but I think, you know, we prefer working at the, the more sort of cinematic frame rates for that sort of stuff. Uh, but what is quite good if we're shooting product footage uh, then we, I will quite often shoot at uh, 50 or 60 frames per second just because it's a sort of quick, cheap way to get a sort of, sort of slow-mo. You can halve the speed of the video playback um, and it just makes everything look a little bit smoother and fancier uh, when you're doing sort of beauty shots of the product. Oh, nice. And Sarah's asked about video camera recommendations. Chris, any any recommendations in terms of cameras? There are obviously yeah, others available, but what, what would you yeah. what do you use? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We um we have a combination of different cameras. We have a we have a, a lot of uh, DSLR cameras um first and foremost. Now they range in price. I mean, you can get quite cheap ones that'll do the job for um you know on eBay for a few hundred few hundred pounds or dollars. Um, 
but with with uh, with DSLRs, you've really got to be careful about um, the audio capabilities. So the the sort of the more expensive ones you get, um, we have a 5D Mark four or one or something like that. Um, and that's four, yeah. a few, <laughs> Mark four. Uh, and that has um, audio capabilities as well. So we can hook up a microphone and headphones as well. And um, for us able, basically it's, it allows us to do that. And with the interchangeable lenses, you get that sort of cinema quality uh, style that you want. Um, we also have a cinema camera. We have a, a Canon C100, which you can pick them up for quite a decent price now. And uh, they're essentially a video camera, but uh, also a DSLR as well, but it doesn't take photos. Um, it's it's really nice. They recognize Canon that the, uh, they essentially could you know, create a video version of a DSLR and they have done with that. And it has all the, the correct audio outputs and, and everything like that. And it has some built-in filters too. Um, we use that, it fits with all your Canon pho uh, photography lenses and everything like that. And it's just a great camera, really portable and does the job. Awesome. And Michelle's asked about mirrorless cameras. I don't actually know what a mirrorless camera is. Perhaps someone could enlighten me. And then uh, she's saying, I'm an animator who's trying to get into some videography. And she's asking for thoughts on, on mirrorless cameras. Will, what do you reckon? Uh, yeah, they can be really great. You can get some really nice uh, footage from those. Uh, again, it's similar to a DSLR, basically, but uh, without the the big mecha mechanical mirror assembly. Uh, so they tend to be a little bit smaller and lighter, but the picture quality is very similar. Again, I'd say the thing to watch is the audio capabilities because they will be mm. uh, sort of very... Essentially, you know, if they're basically stills cameras that can do video, the audio tends to be a little bit of an afterthought. Yeah. Uh, so it'd be worth looking for the specs on that, making <clears> sure that even basic things like can you plug in uh, a microphone and headphones at the same time into two separate jacks so that you can listen back to what you're recording. A lot of them won't even have that because, you know, they're not designed around recording audio. So, yeah, either stepping up a, a couple of models to the, the ones that give you that or looking at a separate audio recording system where you record audio alongside it and then sync it up in editing later. Yeah. Separate separate recording of audio is is standard for a lot of places, but it it can be a faff if you're on your own doing you know, you get if you're getting into videography or anything like that, it can be a faff to be able to have to sync up the audio afterwards in, in post production, but also when you're on the shoot as well, when you just want to basically point shoot and make sure everything's everything's right. Um, I'd always be looking at the the images to make sure that you have that that you know that port for headphones and and a microphone as well because as soon as you have that then then you you you're good to go then you you'd be a, you'd be um you'd be ready for, to be a bit of a self shooter. Yeah, I think that's the reason why we like the uh, the C100 and that yeah you know, that cinema yeah. series from Canon because they have really nice picture quality but they also have all the pro audio stuff you need built in. They've even got XLR yeah. inputs rather than mini jacks, so you, we can use the pro microphones really easily with them. Awesome. And then a question from higher in Cambridge. He's asking, can you save your projects in Canva uh, and Vimeo so you can go back and edit them later on? Sarah, I think you can, right? Yeah, I did. I did actually reply in the chat because I just spotted okay. it. But yeah, <laughs> yes, you can. You you can you keep the project and you can do whatever you want with it afterwards. You can Canva is actually really good for resizing graphics to create all different graphics for the same campaign because you can just design it in one size and it lets you resize it, move elements around. It's a bit trickier to find a video, um, an editable draft of your video on Vimeo, but it is still possible. But at, off the top of my head, I don't even know what the, the chain of clicks is, so you will probably have to search it, but it is possible. Awesome. Right, we'll go on to the next section with, I think Chris is going to get us started first. Um, but before you, before I hand over Chris, guys, keep the questions coming in. Really good ones so far. We will get to as many as we can um, as, soon, as soon as we get the opportunity. So Chris, over to you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Um, yeah, so the great thing about, about video um, is that you can distribute it anywhere to anyone at any time. Um, and I actually recall a brief a few years ago uh, from a client who had just finished up a press conference where afterwards one of their their customers who actually just so happened to be uh, one of the most well-renowned in his field um it was professor sir colin humphreys uh, so double whammy uh, he actually spoke really positively about their uh, bench top scanning electron microscope and he actually stated that every lab should have one of their instruments you know a great testimonial great snippet i'm sure everyone everyone was really really happy but if i uh, if i use the saying if a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it does it make a sound uh, and that was definitely what was true true here with no one capturing this on film 
that's where that's where uh, me and my learned colleague will uh, entered <laughs> into the project uh, so the client uh, asked us on monday on a monday to uh, to visit the university of cambridge on tuesday uh, and uh, all he wanted was just to capture that one snippet on camera uh, no problem on our side whatsoever um but then our thoughts we turned to what what are they going to do with this snippet you know, if it's a snippet that's, you know, about 10 seconds, there's only so much you can really do with that. But luckily, um, you know, we thought, well, we're going to be talking to one of the bigger names in material science. They know it was a lot to talk about. So we quickly put together a script. We put together some interview questions that we could actually just ask him on the day. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to capture the snippet that he said at the press event, but we wanted to wrap it up into a narrative that can be distributed multiple times in multiple formats. You see, a video testimonial in my mind uh, should follow a similar structure to a written case study. You know, what do they do? You know, what product do they use? How does it help them achieve their goals? You know, with the interviewee, we talked about material science in detail, metallurgy, turbine technology, implants, and how scanning electron microscopy is critical to that. You know, we talked about the challenges of traditional technology and how benchtop technology, namely the product in question, actually helps in that research. You know, he then ended the whole thing by saying that every lab, and every school in the world needs this particular benchtop scanning electron microscope. So we, we were able to get exactly what they needed and, and then some. So with all this, with all this content, we edited three videos. You know, product related B roll and images alongside application focused stock footage gave the video a real documentary style. And um, we then we then transcribed and edited the video into written content that could be hosted on the website um, with the videos embedded. Um, subtitles then allowed this video to be shared socially or played on loop at trade shows. And um, so from one conversation at a press event to a few people. The video version actually has been viewed now over 220,000 times on YouTube. So um, it certainly, certainly was a success. Um, considering, I think we, I think we, I think we completed it in about a week, didn't we? Will um, from from filming to uh, to actually editing. Um, so yeah. So um, well. Yeah. So as we've said, you know. Uh, we're going to i'm going to talk a little bit about another case study that covers a lot of the sort of themes we've been talking about um one of the questions that we've had quite a lot from sort of clients and people we've worked with on video in the past is how long should our video be and the sort of received wisdom the sort of standard answer to that is keep it to about three or four minutes uh just because that's the that's a good length for the typical kind of attention span online um I don't think that's necessarily the best answer anymore. It's still not a bad rule of thumb to go off, particularly if you're not sure uh, what sort of thing you want to do. Like it, it, it still works, but really the answer should be, well, how long can you justify depending on the story you've got to tell? How long can you make the video and have it still be engaging? Like if, if you have a really interesting video that's gonna keep people hooked, then there's no reason why that couldn't be longer. And indeed, even like YouTube's algorithm has changed in the last couple of years to reflect this. Like it used to really penalize longer videos. Now, uh, if you're trying to rank a video in YouTube, it's actually better to have it around 10 minutes. Whereas that, that those that you know, definitely didn't used to be the case. So one of the some some of the videos that we've done that are the most effective and that we kind of enjoy doing the most is when we get an interviewee who's really great on camera, who's a fantastic storyteller. And they kind of do a lot of the work for you and they can give you all this content that you can carve up and use. Um, and uh, an example of that, as I said, is it's in the handout section. It's a series of videos we did on tribology with a guy called Don Cohen uh, from Detroit. He works in a tribology lab for uh, a lot of automotive companies in the area. Uh, and this guy was exactly that. The client came to us saying, we have this customer. He's He can really talk. You know, he's a great storyteller. We want to get him on camera. Uh, they were fully bought into that kind of plan from the start. Uh, but if anything, he gave us too much to work with. You know, we had single questions that would prompt 15, 16, 19 minute answers. Like, well, 
you know, how, how do we work with that? How do we make the most of that? If we try and pack that into a three and a half minute video, that's, you know, supposedly optimized, it's just not going to do it justice. Uh, so what we ended up doing is, uh, we ended up editing the whole thing down to around 13 or 14 minutes of video in total, which made quite a nice sort of, uh, mini documentary length. But then again, to make the most of that, we actually split it up into three sections. Uh, three videos that we could then promote as a series and build an entire marketing campaign around dripping those out one at a time. Uh, the first video just talking about, you know, the very basics of, you know, what is tribology? Why is it important in the automotive industry? Um, Don even went back as far as why is there even an automotive industry in Detroit? Like, why is it there? So you know, he had a lot to say. Um, and then the middle portion was about the specific problems that his customers come to him and ask him to solve. And then the final video uh, then became more of the testimonial where it's about how does these, the, the, yeah, the specific tools that he's using, how do they help him solve these problems? And uh, so, yeah, the, the overall series has the kind of, this kind of obvious beginning, middle and end. But because there was so much content, we were able to create these smaller stories, each with their own beginning, middle and end that make these really engaging little videos uh, that, and we can uh, link into this kind of uh, Netflix style, you know, sort of uh, box set binging culture where we can say, hey, you know, come back next week, check out the next episode and have people sort of uh, waiting on the rest of the story. Um, and talking about, as we were talking about earlier, you know, what do we bring along? Like we always, we tend to be a little bit sort of over the top in terms of things like batteries and memory cards. Like we always have about five times as much as we think we're actually going to need. And it's people like Don Cohen who made us <laughs> realize why we do that because we could easily have run out of space if we've been planning to do a 20 minute interview. So yeah, I'll pass back to Danny there. Awesome, thanks Will. Um... Will's just mentioned it there. I'll just drive one's attention to the handout section. You can see that Tribology series that Will was just talking about there. It's a, it's a really good watch. There's three videos in there. So check those out when you've got uh, when you've got some time. There's also some more content about video marketing and um, links to the next webinar, which is in a couple of weeks. And also uh, there's a link to connect with the speakers on LinkedIn today, which I would encourage people to do if they have any follow-up questions that aren't answered today. We're going to move on to the final section, which is about distribution. Uh, and Will, I'm coming straight back to you because I want to talk about how how people, how scientists consume content or video content in 2021, 2022. Yes, yeah, so that, that does follow on from what I was saying. So I think the, the way people consume video content has got more diverse, particularly in the last couple of years uh, over the COVID lockdown. Uh, people have been watching a lot more Netflix. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, you know, doing a lot more virtual events, webinars, you know, in lieu of actual physical events in person, trade shows and things. Um, and also at the other extreme, uh, stuff like TikTok has totally blown up. Um, so, yeah, I think, as I was saying, that kind of standard YouTube video from 10 years ago, where you said, you know, make it under five minutes, keep it snappy and engaging. That's become now, that's sort of broadened out into a whole range of different kinds of video content from 10 hour long box set series to hour long webinars, there's still a place for those core sort of promo marketing videos and like interview clips that are three or four minutes long. But then you also have 30 second social media clips, um, which, you know, I think everyone's consuming a lot more video content, but also a much broader range of video content. And that's really important to bear in mind that there is a, a an appetite for that. There is a market for it. Yeah. I think it's a lot of marketers' favorite sort of phrase that people have got 10 seconds or eight second attention spans or small, shorter than a fit. I mean, I've been guilty of using that uh, phrase before. Um, but it's interesting, isn't it, that whilst TikTok is becoming more popular and that 15 second is becoming interesting at the same time, for more people listening to podcasts than ever before, more people are watching webinars and longer videos and series and they'll sit there and they'll watch a series for a good few hours. So that long form content and the very short form content are certainly have a have a very big part to play in, in the marketing mix at the moment. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's important to think about, you know, when you're building a video campaign, uh, like Chris was saying, you know, can you film a video that you can use in multiple different ways? Can you have an interview 
a video podcast, you know, like a Joe Rogan style thing that's like an hour long, can you then cut that down to uh, maybe three videos that are five minutes each that you could, that are your main sort of meat and potato sort of YouTube video style? Uh, and then can you cut that up again and make some 30 second, 60 second clips that you can put on LinkedIn, that you can put on Instagram, that you can use to hook people into the longer content if they're interested in the and they want to engage with the longer form stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and then, Chris, this question, this, everything we've talked about sounds great and we produce these really good quality videos. But how do they then help sales team to generate sale or marketing to generate leads that generate sales? Well, I think with a. First and foremost, if you think about think about how we, you know, it's coming up to Christmas, for example, you know, we're looking at, at the buying things for our loved ones uh, or what we want for ourselves, um, and uh, we we looking at we're looking at it products. We'll, we'll look at things online. We'll look at the uh, look at the website, but then we'll look at other websites, third parties. Then we'll look at the videos. And one of the things that we like to do is we look at review videos, which is essentially a testimonial video in itself, isn't it? And I guess. One of the things which, which is which is really good in terms of being able to create leads is to be able to think right. Okay, so this individual um, is in the same research area as I am. Um, they're using this instrument and they're doing this research. Um, I'm really interested in being able to either replicate that or do something or do something similar. It's important as well from from a from a perspective of, of trying to trying to bring in bring in those leads is to make sure that your video is 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 accurate in every in every simple every single way so for example if you're going to be uh, doing a demo in in your, in your lab um you need to make sure that if you need to wear a, a white coat you wear a white coat you know if you need if you need to be wearing gloves you need to be wearing gloves do they need to be are they the right color because uh, sometimes that can be a thing you know uh, do you need to wear goggles you know because if you, if anything's different if anything's not right then you're going to lose your audience and those are the little details, the little details that sometimes that you that you might just you might just over you know you might just overthink and think oh I don't need to I don't need to worry about that it'd be fine just do the demo just uh, press the button and, and run the run the sample whereas if something's a little bit off um, then you've lost you've lost your um, lost your potential uh, customer there. Awesome, yeah. Um, I know we've spoken a bit about funnels before, and you have different types of videos for all different types of different uh times on the funnel so it's definitely definitely something to 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 look at if you're not doing you're not using video as part of your marketing campaigns sara will touched a bit about tiktok but what about other social media what type of video works well on on social media well as you were saying before we for social media you have to keep it short and sweet the attention span has decreased so try i'd say try and pack as much action into those first sort of five to ten seconds as you can just try and grab that try to have that scroll stopping that's the word i was looking for that <laughs> scroll stopping element and even two two to three second boomerangs or basically looped videos can work well if they're complemented with good copy and good visuals another thing i would say we are social people so when we're on social media we like to interact with other humans so if the videos picture a person talking about the topic, it will get more engagement as well. So to sum it up, short, easy, and, and relatable. Yeah, awesome. One of these things I've started doing actually on link. This is just on LinkedIn, but uh, as I scroll, every time I stop to look at something, I take a screenshot of that thing to see why to see if there's any reason why mm -hmm. I stopped. And after a while, it's. I mean, I've only just started this, but I'll look at it in like a month's time and see if there's any recurring <laughs> themes. So. And if there's anything we can pick up from that to then use in our advertising or our copywriting or things like that. So um, Funny, to think about. It's, it's, it's colors for me. If if I see a video that's using the same kind of animation, the same kind of colors I'm drawn to, I'd, I'd, I'll stop. Mm. So I don't, I don't know how to use that to our advantage because it's so singular to each person, but it, it is really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think to do it, I mean, this is just like... Um, me being a bit of a loser, I think, but I think to do it on like a, a big to a big scale, you'd need to test it on lots of different people to see yeah. if there's any sort of recurring themes. And uh, but some something to think about. And um, there's been a message from Paul saying he can't see the handout, so I'm just going to quickly uh, poll the audience to see if anyone else is having that same problem, and then we'll we'll follow it up. Um, whilst I'm doing that, Chris, I wanted to ask you about scientists and how they can help with the distribution. So we talked about before about how. Um, 
how once you get them talking and comfortable there they can talk all day about what they're passionate about but how can they then help with the distribution of that video once it's created uh, yeah absolutely i mean one of the biggest challenges is to is to get somebody to um uh, get somebody sort of in the diary uh, to come and do it uh, to actually go and interview them once you've once you've got them and one of the good ways to to sort of um sort of get them to do that is to say you know basically say you know this this is a free video from your perspective you know um you can yeah you can uh, you can basically say you know we can we can put any information that you want in actually including them in, in the review in the review process as well really really helps you know they they get to say oh you know what i like that bit can we change that bit can we do this can we do that um and then they'll usually say are we able to share it uh, share it ourselves because you know if you think about what you know some of their challenges they, they like to promote their research um you know more than ever um so for them to be able to do that it's great and always the way i'd always start one of those videos is to talk about their research because if you think about if you think about exhibitions you know people and they go and do presentations um at exhibitions you know people who are coming to see that are like-minded individuals and that's who the video is going to be targeted at and um, so that always helps so it's like a little mini video for them as well and they become a lot more responsive about uh, about sharing the video awesome that's wonderful uh so it looks like we've got a mixed bag of people who can see and can't see the handouts it's just on the right hand side next to q a and polls there should be a tab saying handouts uh, if you still can't if you can find it now if you could change your answer on on the poll if you can't we'll uh we'll follow up with everyone to make sure that everyone's got the links and uh everything they need to to see those and um, Right, we're going to move on to some audience Q&A. Before I do that, I've got a, a special offer for people participating in today's webinar. So uh, if you're interested in what we've been talking about, we're doing a, a, a offer just for today. For, we're going to offer some free social media snippets when you book a video package. All you have to do um, is to click on Express Interest. It will take you to another page. You don't need to, to do anything on that page. We'll follow up with you in the next few days. Uh, so. If you book a video package with us, we'll throw in some free social media snippets that we normally charge over a couple of thousand dollars for. So if you're interested in that, just click on Express Interest and we will follow up with you in the next couple of days. Keep the questions coming in. We're going to we're going to go to a few audience questions now. We've had one from Sarah. I think this will be best for you, Sarah. She's asking, when it comes to social media videos, do you recommend that you always add subtitles if it's a person talking? Yes, absolutely. It's not it's not just thinking about accessibility and availability for everyone, but it also affects your SEO, your engaging, engage, micro engagement metrics, everything. You you do want to have them there. And another thing to consider is most people when they're scrolling and they're on social media on the phone, they don't the videos don't auto play with with sound. So most people will just not even bother you would just watch the video so it has to, if it has subtitles you have more chances of hooking them in and for them to continue watching so yeah you absolutely want subtitles awesome uh yeah i mean i would completely agree we we use them for all of ours uh, all of ours don't you and yeah lots of people watch uh, things on mute um chris has a cat in the background looks very nice <laughs> just oh. made an appearance <laughs> Uh, we'll go back to the question about drones, Chris. So the poll yeah. we had sort of over 50% of people uh, aren't considering it, but 24% have used it in the past. Do most people you find use sort of stock um, drone footage or are they getting people in to, to just to shoot above their warehouse or like you were talking about earlier? Yeah, if you're going to do sort of company, like a company overview video or a corporate video, you know, having some drone footage would be, it'd be a nice to have, not needed, but a nice to have, um, I'd say. Using stock footage is, um, is, is, is really good, especially for some of the drone stuff you've got going. You know, Sarah uh, spoke before about, um, you know, the scroll stopping, um, you know, scroll stopping, for example, having, you know, having a, some nice application focused content, you know, and having some nice drone footage is, is really good. I actually recall we did a video on, on, on cannabis analysis and testing and we got some really nice stock footage from over some uh, fields <laughs> and uh, you know people were asking me when did you do that and uh, but, but no it was all stock footage and um yeah i'd say 
being able to have that just allows it to be a little bit more dynamic. It gives you a little bit more room in the edit as well. So it's, um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say definitely always have a look at stock footage. Awesome. And then we've had a good question about YouTube and they're asking, is YouTube still the best place to host and create uh, a library of company product animation videos uh, in comparison to Vimeo? Well, we were talking about this the other day, actually. What do you what do you think? Yeah. So uh, it's interesting with YouTube and Vimeo because they started out pretty much as competitors, uh, offering more or less the same service, but they've evolved over the last few years to fill quite different niches. So I think YouTube is still the best in terms of distribution. Uh, it has a sort of community around it and people who will look for videos on YouTube specifically to watch, uh, which with Vimeo, that's a very, very small part of it these days. And YouTube also being a Google product, it tends to get favorable rankings in the main search results as well. Uh, so if, you, you know, if you're trying to get your video indexing in Google, uh, having a YouTube, you know, having it on YouTube really helps with that and you can optimize it much better than uh, with most of the platforms. Where Vimeo comes into its own, and where we use it a lot, is more as a video creator. So it has better tools for uh, things like sharing private videos that are drafts for review. It has some really nice tools for that. Obviously, it has Vimeo Create that we've talked about, where you can actually make videos entirely on YouTube, and that's much more full-featured, as far as I'm aware anyway, than, than YouTube Studio is. Um, and just in general, as sort of a video production tool uh that it, it works really well and also as like a showcase for work you know we use it uh to, to put videos up that we've made and to share playlists and stuff like that uh with people who are looking to work with us uh it looks a lot nicer because you don't get all the stuff you get on youtube with the you know the comments and the recommended videos and all the stuff that makes it great for discovering videos uh makes it a little bit clunky and cluttered when you're just trying to share one example so yeah, I think they they both kind of fill different niches. If you're trying to just get eyeballs on your video, YouTube's definitely the way to go. But as a producer of videos, Vimeo is really nice as well. Mm -hmm. Just an important thing, an important thing to consider um, with with your video player as well is um, where where you want to distribute it as well. So with Vimeo and YouTube, you get some you get some quite quite large firewalls in like China or something like that. So um, there are more expensive video um, player options, you know, such as Brightcove. Um, for example, they're a little bit more expensive, but what what it allows you to do is it allows you to be able to to just you know show those videos um, you know in in uh, in China, for example. Awesome. Uh, just a follow up about the SEO side of things. So, how important is it if you if we can rank well with a a YouTube video? How is important? How important is it to think about the title, your description, everything else that goes into the video creation? Yeah, I think you treat it like any other piece of content, you know, the same as you would if you were doing a blog post or a product page. You need to think about the keywords in the title and in the description and the tags. Uh, obviously, with it just being a YouTube video, you don't have as much uh, as many parameters to play with as you do with a, a full web page on your website. Uh, but you should still apply the same sort of methods and you know, think about what keywords you're targeting and stuff like that. It definitely helps. It's, I'd like to add that it's worth noting that a couple of years ago, YouTube has removed the the tag as a SEO, as a way to find your video. So most keywords have to be now in the title and the description instead of tags are a bit, they're phasing them out. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, uh, and sorry, a question for you for uh, Michael's asking about how do you create a 2D animation of screenshots or product software? It, regardless of what software you're using that say breaking down break it down into elements so you have your title you have your supporting text you have your image any other decorative and nice things that you want to make it pretty and animate each one separately that will engage and that will help with the flow of where you want where you want your to direct the eyes over the presentation and just that little thing will make it way more engaging so that's it you can do it in canva you can start over and make a presentation in canva and animate each thing individually or you have pre-made or you can just create it all natively in After Effects and just do whatever you want with it. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say as well with most kind of technical scientific software, it's worth, it's usually worth breaking it down and trying to do a sort of representation of what the software is doing rather than just showing the full screenshot. Firstly, it'll be, it'll be easier to understand for people just sort of glancing at it or on a small screen where they might not be able to see all the details, uh, but also it will be future proof. So if you update your software in you know, three years after you've made the video and the actual interface looks different, 
then all of a sudden that animated video is you know useless because it's going to look wrong if it's got an actual screenshot of the software in but if you have a you know sort of animated representation of what's happening then that's going to be you know probably much more translatable to whatever you do with the software in the future if you and if you don't have if you don't have any of that if you if you're just you know working with what you've got and, and limited budgets you know there are there are you know free tools that you can use to get some screen captures um screen capture software on your machines you know so you can actually record um your software as and when it happens and they you know there's a software um piece of software called camtasia which essentially allows you to record um record your screen or record bits as uh, you know pieces of software and then it allows you to be quite funky in terms of zooming in on certain in certain bits and it's quite it's it's really good it's a really simple piece of software that um that you can download and get a free trial for Awesome. Uh, we'll take a few more questions. Um, it looks like most people have managed to to solve the handouts issue. If you still can't see them, uh, I'll follow up in the next couple of days and send you links to all, to all of those. Uh, so apologies for anyone who hasn't been able to download the handouts today. A question from uh, Inez. She's asking, do you have any recommended tools for adding subtitles easily to existing videos? Uh, there's loads, aren't there, Sarah? What do, mm -hmm. what do you think? Yeah. So what, so what I'd recommend it's subtitle. It's it's that what you can just upload a video and they they subtitle it for you. Of course, you're gonna have to come in and fine tune it because you know there's mistakes. I believe it's a machine that does it, so you have to adjust it. But you have a, a pretty pretty decent base to work with, or you can send your videos to Ref R R E V for a person to subtitle and then they have their own editor where you can make any changes to the subtitles as you want. So those two are really, really helpful. Yeah, you can uh, you can also do um, subtitles in different languages using using the um, Rev as well. Yeah, uh, but I just reiterate what Sarah said, if you do use one of the sort of AI systems quite often, there will be lots and lots and lots of mistakes in there. So you do need to, it does require some, uh, some human input yeah. as well. The machines haven't taken over that just yet. Yeah, particularly on technical content. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. If, if there's anything complex about what it is you're mm -hmm. selling, then there will be some weird and wonderful um, interpretations <laughs> of, of that with the AI systems. Uh, good question from Steve saying, do you have any tip for promoting YouTube videos to the right B2B audience? Uh, will, I think you probably have the most YouTube experience. Uh, yeah, again, so... Well, there is a, as I said, there's kind of a, a user base on YouTube that will try and find stuff on there. Uh, yeah, narrowing that down to like a relevant B2B audience is quite difficult. Um, what we always try and do is recommend that people use the the video from where you, whether you've got it on YouTube or Vimeo, the same thing applies. Um, basically embed that in lots of other kinds of content. So if it's about a product, embed it on your product page, you know, anywhere else, you, if you have it listed with us or anyone else, your sort of product listing sites, make sure it's on there as well. Um, and embed that same link everywhere. And that will essentially add more views and more eyeballs onto that video, which will help it in the YouTube algorithm. Um, but it's also essentially using uh, all the other tools you have to get eyes on any content. You know, that still applies to the video. So with a lot of the interview ones we do, we'll produce a written version of the interview as well and then embed the video in that. So anyone who's you know, who finds the interview, first of all, through you know, a Google search, just finds the article. Uh, if that's, you know, turns out to be better op optimized in their search, if they decide they want to watch the video, it's right there for them. So I think, yeah, just getting it uh, around on as many different, through as many different channels as you can is uh, a really good way to do that. Awesome. And then we'll finish off on, on this question. We're getting to the hour now. So Chris, I'll come to you first, but guys, if you've got any other thoughts, please jump in with them. Any recommendations on how to hook scientists in less than a minute? Cool. Um, how to hook scientists in less than a, in less than a minute. Um, talk about research. Um, that would be my, that would be, that would be my main one is talk about the research because that's what they're interested in. Yeah. And good, good answer. I think that, yeah. that applies to to any anything, doesn't it? If you, whoever the audience is, whatever is that interests them the most, get that in early doors, and people will be interested in the rest of the rest of the video. Anything else to add, guys, before we wrap things up? Don't think so. Nothing for me. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, thanks, thank you, Chris, Sarah, Will, um, for sharing 
your wonderful expertise with us all today. Uh, thank you to the audience as well for, for tuning in. Um, apologies again about the handouts. If you weren't able to, to look into those, we will send those over to you um, very, very soon. If you are joining us from the US, then have a happy Thanksgiving. And we'll see you all at the next event, which is in a couple of weeks' time, where we'll be presenting the findings of our State of Scientific Marketing Survey. So hopefully we can see you all then. Thanks again, and see you all soon. See you soon. <laughs>